Well, hello, South Bay and friends and family and those of you who are visiting, watching. Uh, so glad to have you connecting with us. Uh, my name is Trey Clark, and it is a blessing to be invited back uh, to share uh, by Pastor Lynn. And so today uh, we'll be continuing the teaching series that he's doing on the ancient letter uh, in the New Testament known as Titus. And so I invite you to hear with me God's word to us today in Titus coming from chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Your version may sound similar, it may sound a little bit different, uh, but listen with me to God's word to us in Titus chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show every courtesy to everyone. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, despicable, hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of any works of righteousness that we had done, but according to his mercy, through the water of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. This spirit he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The saying is sure. I desire that you insist on these things so that those who have come to believe in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable to everyone. I would like to share for a few minutes under the title, The Verbs of God. The Verbs of God. I imagine the young minister Titus is overwhelmed, discouraged, and baffled by the task before him. He has been left on the island of Crete near Greece by the apostle, church planner, and missionary Paul. He was left with the goal of building up house churches. But these are tough times for life and tough times for ministry. The people in Crete are apparently known for not living with integrity. One of their poets, Epimenides, once said, Cretans are always liars, vicious brutes, lazy gutton, gluttons. In other words, he says Cretans are, are addicted to deception. They are addicted to violence. They are addicted to consumption. Now, no doubt this is a kind of stereotype because no group is always anything, but this does seem to be a general description of the kind of instability, the kind of confusion, the kind of chaos of the culture on Crete. It seems that the Apostle Paul is writing then to Titus because the leadership and the culture of the Cretans is influencing the leadership and the culture of the churches in Crete. The deception of the culture is becoming the deception of the church. The brutal violence of the culture is becoming the brutal violence of the church. The unbridled consumption of the culture is becoming the unbridled consumption of of the church. To put it another way, the churches on the island of Crete were reflecting the verbs of the culture more than the verbs of God. Now, I confess I am no expert of the English language. However, I do remember, I do remember my first grade teacher, Mrs. McKinney, teaching us something about verbs. I would later learn about many different types of verbs, but, but, but Miss McKinney told me that a verb is an action word, a doing word. She introduced me to verbs as words that signified action, happenings, occurrences, turn, shout, smile, run. Miss McKinney told me verbs are about action. 
Here in this letter to Titus, Paul speaks about the action of God. He calls church leaders and the churches who would have had this letter read to them to live in ways that reflect God's action in and through them. In the first verse, Paul is reminding the church to live respectful to political powers and authorities. The call to respect political powers and authorities echoes Paul's teaching in other places in the New Testament, such as Romans 13 and and 1 Timothy 2. And of course, the book of Daniel in the Old Testament and the book of Acts and Revelation in the New Testament, they show that there is a time for resisting, for resisting governing authorities in order to embody faithfulness to God. But here, here the emphasis is a call to, the, it's an emphasis on the call to submit to authorities, to submit to those governing officials as a way to enhance Christian witness. In the rest of verse 1 and in verse 2, Paul calls the Christians in Crete to be characterized by love and goodwill. Goodwill to the general public. To speak evil of no one. To avoid quarreling. To be gentle. To be gentle. To show courtesy to everyone. Everyone. Now, can you imagine with me, just imagine with me, if these simple words shaped all of our interactions on social media? How might we begin to relate differently to that neighbor or that friend or church member or family member with whom we find ourselves just just deeply disagreeing with? What if we learn to interact with a kind of convicted civility? Maintaining convictions without trying to crush people with our convictions. This has been a challenge for many of us in this season, myself included. And apparently it was also a challenge for the churches in Crete. They are reflecting the action of the culture more than the action of God. However, Paul reminds them that this is unfitting. In verse 3, Paul says, they were Foolish. They were disobedient. They were led astray. They were slaves to various passions and pleasures. But that was their past life, their, their past action. The issue is that their past action is reflecting their current action. We all have different pasts. And sometimes that attitude or that habit or that ad- addiction in the past can be triggered and find itself as the norm of our present. But deep down, we know that this too is unfitting. So what do we do? What do we do when we've let the way of Crete be more foundational to our identity than the way of Christ? What is the solution? Paul doesn't just tell Titus to tell the people in Crete to try harder to be good. He knows that that self-salvation is often another word for self-destruction. So instead, Paul reminds the people in Crete of the world-transforming, new creation-producing action of God. This action that is the foundation and the fuel of their life as Christians. In other words, as he does in Romans and in Ephesians, Paul calls the church to live into who they already are in Christ as a result of what God has done in Christ. Now, there's so much that we could explore in the next uh, few verses, verses 4 through 7. This is a long complex passage in in Greek and the original language of the New Testament. It's actually one long sentence. Some believe it was a creed. Some believe it was a baptismal formula or a hymn in the early church. It seems like in verses 4 through 7, Paul is, is grappling for language to describe the kind of expansive, life altering reality that we see in God's action to redeem creation. I simply just want to offer some brief reflections, some brief reflections on four verbs or or descriptions of the action of God in this passage that that have ministered to me in this challenging season. So first, in verse four, Paul says, 
that in the midst of our foolishness as Christians, and everyone knows that we can be foolish, in the midst of our disobedience, in the midst of our malice, in the midst of our envy and hate, the goodness and loving kindness of God appeared. God showed up. God manifested, God revealed God's self, not because we are so good and not even because we are so bad, but it was all God's gracious self-revelation, God's gracious self-giving of God's self. The Christian faith rises or falls on the grace of God. Not on the empty power of Greek gods or Americans who think they're gods, but on the story of the gracious God of Israel revealed in Jesus Christ. Jesus, one born to an unmarried teenager, one raised in a ghetto called Nazareth, one who spent his life with outsiders, outcasts, and people who are often overlooked. This Jesus, this Jesus is the embodiment of God's goodness and loving kindness appearing, being made known, being revealed to humanity. How is God appearing in your life in this season? Is it grand or dramatic or, or maybe as it is in my life, often it's, it's subtle, ordinary even. Sometimes so pedestrian I can easily overlook it. God is not just one who appeared in the past, but God is present, active among us, even in the most challenging and complex and confusing of seasons. Paul says God appeared, but God didn't just appear. In verse 5, Paul says God saved. God, God saved. It's a wonderful thing to be saved, to be rescued, to be set free, to be delivered. Free from sin, free from self-absorption, free from the idolatry of politics, from the idolatry of popularity, the, the idolatry of power. Through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, God throws a life vest to a drowning world. God, Paul says, is a gracious God who saves. Now, Sadly, some of us who experience this truth can oddly become the most judgmental, the most self-righteous, and the most critical of others. I think of a dear friend that is resistant to having anything to do with the church because of the way Christians have condemned her because of her past. Many of us as Christians, we receive God's grace with joy, with excitement, with appreciation, but we seek to restrict God's grace from others. It seems at times we, we fear that God's grace is in short supply. We want to keep it to ourselves. I want to keep it to myself. We want to secure our sense of, of self-importance. But the reality is that like the five loaves and two fish that Jesus used to feed 5,000 plus people, God's grace multiplies as it's given away. This multiplying grace is a demonstration of God's super abundant mercy. A mercy that's visible, Paul says, in the cleansing and renewing work of the Holy Spirit in the midst of our less than perfect lives. In verse 6, Paul goes on to say that, that God poured, God poured this cleansing, renewing spirit out richly. The spirit that brooded over creation. The spirit that brooded over creation. The spirit that gave life to dead bones. This spirit. This spirit is poured out on all flesh, on all who trust in the saving work of Jesus Christ. Jew and Gentile, male and female, old and young, Democrat and Republican, those with papers, those without papers, those with a PhD, those with no degree. God's spirit is poured out richly. I've been meditating on this this week. 
the expansive nature of God's spirit. God's spirit that, that relativizes our sense of importance to other people. That God's spirit is not constrained, that it's not captured in a box, but it breaks out of the categories in which we try to keep it and reminds us of the lavishness of God's mercy. Finally, in verse 7, Paul says, This spirit, this spirit is poured out so that having been justified by God's grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Not only does God appear, not only does God save, and not only does God pour out God's spirit, but Paul says Christians are justified, justified by God's grace. Justification is a legal metaphor. Imagine a person sitting nervously, waiting to be declared guilty in the court of law. And then suddenly, the guilty one is made innocent. Not by talking their way out of condemnation, not by trying to prove that they're a changed person, but, but through the justice of God that comes unexpectedly in one who stands in their place. This justice is made available through Jesus, Paul says. As he puts it in 2 Corinthians 5.21, He who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. This is reason for gratitude. This is reason for joy. The Christian message is a message of hope, possibility, and transformation for all creation. But it isn't just something to cherish with gratitude. In verse 8, Paul tells Titus, Insist on these things so that those who have come to believe in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. God's glorious work of transformation in us, in other words, is supposed to lead to participating in God's glorious work of transformation in the world. Even as we wait for the fullness of that to come in the world to come. In other words, Paul says that, that God's world-transforming, new creation-producing action in us moves us to be, to be the, the verbs of God in the world. Imperfectly, of course. Inconsistently, absolutely. And yet, empowered by the Spirit, God moves us forward still to reflect in word and in deed the action of God in the world. Sisters and brothers, siblings, in the midst of the instability, the chaos, and the confusion of our current time, it's easy to find ourselves reflecting the action of the culture, or worse, more than the action of God. Paul reminds me, he reminds us, God's action in us sets us in motion to participate in God's action in the world. Wherever you are in your spiritual journey, wherever you might be listening to this, my prayer is that we would all find ourselves moved by the Spirit to experience and embody the life-altering, world-transforming, verbs of God. God bless you.